Howdy do. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Scripps, for having me. All you nice folks uh, for coming out. Kima, uh, for coming all the way from Los Angeles. <laughs> Thank you for having um, me, inviting me. <laughs> I usually spend uh, Tuesday nights at home in my apartment weeping over my regrets. So this is a nice change of pace, <laughs> for me anyway, and, and perhaps uh, some of you as well. So, um, yeah, so the, the new book is called The Nickel Boys. Um, I found out about uh, the Dozier School for Boys that it's based on from a newspaper uh, report. I get you know, ideas from all different kinds of places. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just walking down the street thinking. Sometimes it's a news report. Um, I got an idea from a, a dream once. Uh, zone one, uh, my zombie book came I from... I was that one. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> came from a dream I had last night. You know, I um, uh, grew up late 70s uh, with very permissive parents. And, uh, you know, we got cable as soon as it was invented. So we wouldn't have to talk to each other. <laughs> and uh, we'd watch whatever movie. So I was, I was like nine when I first saw Clockwork Orange. And uh, I remember my brother and my parents were watching it, and I was like, you know, Mom, what's happening to that woman up on screen? And she was like, it's a comment on society. Shh, I'm trying to watch, you know, some Kubrick. Um, I saw Not Living Dead a little too early. You know, it was on PBS one Halloween when I was like 10 or 11. And I was struck by the fact that it had a, a black protagonist, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. didn't happen a lot outside black exploitation. And, um, you know, it was about a, a black man being pursued by uh, white creatures who want to rip him limb from limb, so, which is sort of like a story of America. And, um, <laughs> and it, you know, got deep into my consciousness. And I saw Dawn of the Dead in theaters, I was like 12. And for decades, I would have zombie dreams, like once a month, for year after year. And sometimes they were fast, you know, sometimes they were slow. Sometimes they would catch me, sometimes not, they would talk depending on my sort of psychological weather. And this went on for, for many years until 2009. Um, I was going through some life changes. Uh, my father had passed away. Um, I was uh, getting divorced. There were some hints I was getting divorced, uh, such as getting a divorce lawyer. That sort of clued, <laughs> clued me in. Uh, but every summer, we'd, you know, we'd have house guests out in Long Island um, uh, it was a, a house that my grandfather built in the 40s. It was very thin walls. It's basically like a, a no sex house. I always try to tell guests when they come, you know, it's July 4th, we'll do some grillings, fireworks, no sex. No sex. Because you can hear everything. <laughs> and so I was in this turbulent moment in my life, and my friends came out July 4th, and I woke up and I heard them talking and laughing through the thin walls. And um, I just wanted them to go, because I couldn't, uh, but I invited them. So I, I willed myself back to sleep, which is a, a skill I've learned over the years. And I had a dream, here's where it comes in, that I, I was in New York, but I couldn't go into my living room, because I didn't know if they'd swept the zombies out yet. And I woke up, and I was like, yes, that's a, you know, when the apocalypse is over, and you have some zo zombie stragglers around, someone has to go and clean them up. And I was like, that's a good idea. Usually, if you wake up in the middle of the night, and you have a dream, you write it down, you wake up, it's like something terrible, like, kill my dad and make out with my mother, you know? That's not like, that's not like a novel. Uh, it's a short story, maybe. Plus, it's been done before. So, um, but in that case, I was very lucky. And then, in the case of the Underground Railroad, um, I was sitting on my couch, it was the year 2000, and I came across a reference to the railroad. I remembered how when I was a little kid, those words were so evocative, I thought it was a literal train beneath the earth, which is you know, very impossible, obviously. We have like seven miles of subway in New York, and we can barely keep that running. So like, thousands of miles beneath Indiana is like, really not possible. But I know I'm not the only person who thought that. Mm -hmm. I've met many people who have gone on to their 60s and 70s thinking it's a real train. I, I gave a talk in Florida a year and a half ago, and before I went on, this woman came up to me, she was in her 60s, and she said, uh, have there been any studies about the cave-ins? <laughs> and I was like, you know, sorry? 
And he said, yeah, you know, the tunnels were so deep underground, there had to be a lot of cave-ins. I didn't study that. Oh and I was like, really? Um, <laughs> so it just goes to show you how evocative those two words are and how crappy our educational system is. <laughs> um, but I thought that day in the spring of 2000, you know, what if I did make this literal train? What kind of story could I get out of it? And that's like a premise, so I added the Gulliver's Travels thing where each state that our protagonist goes through is a different state of American possibility. It's Gulliver's Travels, it's like the Odyssey, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, where a hero or heroine has to go through a series of allegorical adventures and solve the problem before she can move on to the next one. And it seemed like such a good idea that I knew I would have screwed it up if I did it back then when I was 30. I was very immature, sort of hanging out every night. And I thought, if I, was a better, if I was a better writer, I could pull it off in a technical sense, if I wrote more books. If I um, was older and more mature, I could write about slavery in the way it was supposed to be. Um, if I saw the world, had some Hemingway-esque adventures, stabbed a hobo with a penknife or something, I could bring that life experience to the book and make it, make it sing. So each time I finished a book, I would pull out my notes and ask myself, am I ready? And the answer was always no, until five years ago, I, I told a, an idea to my editor, but I was having some doubts about it, so I decided to tell him about this underground, I decided to tell my wife about this Underground Railroad idea and share the idea, get her feedback. Um, as some of you know, sometimes in a marriage you have to make conversation to kill the silences. So I told her <laughs> about the idea, and she just said, well, I don't want to say that the book you're working on now about a Brooklyn writer going through a midlife crisis <laughs> is dumb, per se. Um, but his other book sounds really good. So I was like, huh. Um, I told my, edit, my, my agent, I worked with her for many years. Um, she's always very supportive. And she just said, well, both ideas are good, which is not very helpful. But then she did something she never does, which was, emailed me on a Sunday, and she said, I can't stop thinking about this other idea of yours. So that was like two votes. Wednesday was shrink day, so I told my shrink, and she just said, what are you, crazy? Um, <laughs> I mean, we both know you're crazy, but with your issues, you should totally work on this idea or whatever. So that just left my editor, who I already sold this other idea to, so with some trepidation, I called him up, and he just said, giddy up, motherfucker which is old school publishing talk for that sounds very compelling and you should pursue it. Um, <laughs> so I did and it worked out okay. Um, but the Nickel Boys is based on a real life reform school that operated in Florida for 110 years. Uh, it wasn't just juvenile delinquents who would go there, it was uh, orphans and wards of the state, people who had, kids who had nowhere else to go. And even from its opening uh, in 1903, three years after it opened, they found kids as young as six shackled, uh, put in solitary confinement, and every couple years there'd be an investigation and talk of reform, and then it would recede and nothing would happen. And this went on for many, many years until 2011. And then in the summer of 2014, they were trying to develop the land and uh, they found 55 unmarked graves and there were students who had died of influenza, and also students who had like blunt force trauma to their skulls and buckshot in their skeletons, uh, who'd been killed. And um, uh, it was a very rough summer, it was like 2014, when I came across this news report. Michael Brown had been killed in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, by white policemen. Uh, Eric Garner, in Staten Island, New York, uh, choked to death by a white policeman on a street corner. And it seemed that no one's ever held accountable for these, kind of, these acts of police brutality. And if we're capturing two on cell phones, how many more are we not seeing? And if there's one dozer school, how many other stories do we not hear about? And um, the, uh, the survivors who were being interviewed in the news reports were mostly white, but the school was majority African American. So I wondered what story, story I could get out of uh, the black side of Dozier in the 60s. So I'm going to read a brief bit and then we'll talk. Oh. Thanks, Kima. 
The boys rooted for Griff, even though he was a miserable bully who jimmied and pried at their weaknesses and made up weaknesses if he couldn't find any, such as calling you a knock-kneed piece of shit, even if your knees had never knocked your whole life. He tripped them and laughed at the ensuing pratfalls and slapped them around when he, he could get away with it. He punked them out, dragging them into dark rooms. He smelled like a horse and made fun of their mothers, which was pretty low given the general motherlessness of the student population. He stole the desserts on multiple occasions, swiped from trays with a grin, and even if the desserts were no great shakes, it was the principle. The boys rooted for Griff because he was going to represent the colored half of nickel at the annual boxing match, and no matter what he did the rest of the year, the day of the fight, he would be all of them in one black body, and he was going to knock that white boy out. If Griff spat teeth before that happened, swell. The Nickel Academy was a reform school for boys, juvenile offenders, wards of the state, orphans, runaways who'd lit out to get away from mothers who entertained men for money or to escape rummy fathers who crept into their bedrooms at night. Some of them had stolen money, cussed at their teachers, damaged public property. They told stories about bloody pool hall fights and uncles who made moonshine. A bunch of them were sent there for offenses they never heard of before. Malingering, mopery, incorrigibility, words the boys didn't understand either, but what was their point when their meaning was clear enough? Nickel. The combat served as a kind of mollifying spell to tide them through the daily humiliations. The colored boys had held the boxing match for 15 years, since 1949. Old hands on the staff remembered the last white champion and still talked him up. Other things about the old days they talked about less often. Terry Doc Burns had been an anvil-handed good old boy from a musty corner of Sewanee County who'd been sent to Nickel for strangling a neighbor's chickens, 21 chickens to be exact, because they were, quote, out to get me, unquote. Pain rolled off them like rain from a slate roof. After Doc Burns had returned to the free world, the white boys who advanced to the final fight were pikers, so wobbly that over the years, tall tales about the former champion had grown more and more extravagant. Nature had gifted Doc Burns with unnaturally long reach. His legendary combo had swatted down every comer and rattled windows. In fact, Doc Burns had been beaten and ill-treated by so many in his life, family and strangers alike, that by the time he arrived at Nickel, all punishments were gentle breezes. This was Griff's first term on the boxing team. He'd arrived at Nickel in February, right after the graduation of the previous champ, Axel Parks. His emergence as the baddest brother on campus had made him Axel's natural successor. Griff was a giant, broad-chested, and hunched like a big brown bear. His daddy, it was said, was on a chain gang in Alabama for killing his mother, making his meanness a handed down thing. Outside the ring, Griff made a hobby of terrorizing the weaker boys, the boys without friends, the weepy ones. Inside the ring, his prey stepped right up so he didn't have to waste time hunting. Like an electric toaster or an automated washing machine, boxing was a modern convenience that made his life easier. The coach for the colored team was a Mississippian named Max David, who worked in a school garage. He got an envelope at the end of the school year for imparting what he'd learned during his welterweight stint. Max David made his pitch to Griff early in the summer. My first fight made me cockeyed, he said, and my farewell fight set my eyes right again. So trust me when I say this sport will break you down to build you up again, and that's a fact. Griff smiled. He pulverized and unmanned his opponents with cruel inevitability throughout autumn. He was not graceful. He was not a scientist. He was a powerful instrument of violence, and that sufficed. 
Given the typical length of an enrollment at Nickel, most students were only around for one or two fighting seasons. As the championship approached, the boys had to be schooled in the importance of those December matches. The prelims within your dorms, the match between your dorm's best guy and the best sluggers from the other two dorms, and then the bout between the best black fighter and whatever chump the white guys put up. The championship was their sole acquaintance with justice at Nickel. Trevor Nickel had started the championship matches in 1946, soon after he came on as a director at the school. He'd never run an institution like that before. His background was in agriculture. He made an impression at clan meetings, however, with his impromptu speeches on moral improvement and the value of work, the disposition of young souls in need of care. The right people remembered his passion when an opening came up. His first Christmas at the school gave the county the chance to witness his improvements. Everything that needed a new coat of paint got a new coat of paint. The dark cells were briefly converted to more innocent use. And the regular beatings relocated to the small white utility shed, nicknamed the White House. Had the good people of Eleanor, Florida seen the industrial fan that was kept in the White House to mask the sound of the screams, they might have had a question or two but the shed was not part of the tour. First, thank you for that incredible reading. Um, it's always such a pleasure to hear directly from the author. Um, I wanna begin by pivoting just a little and asking you a two-part question. Um, and the first part is, where were you when you found out Toni Morrison died. Yeah, I mean, um, like everything that happens, I was probably prone and on my phone looking at Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I remember being a kid, I became an avid reader by reading my mother's books and my sister's books. I had two older sisters. And so whether it was like a, the latest Stephen King, which we got every year, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, when my sisters were in high school and college, Toni Morrison's uh, Sula and Tar Baby. She's always in my, been in my house, uh, tantalizing. Um, uh, before I could understand what the words were, I saw you know her name in my house, and um, I think I only I was taught Black Boy by Richard Wright in sixth grade, and I read an excerpt for Invisible Man in seventh grade. But beside that, I didn't have a single black fiction writer in elementary school or, or high school. So coming to uh, eventually read my sister's Toni Morrison's and reading Beloved in a class. Um, uh, she's been you know, a part of my artistic and intellectual growth for so long. Mm -hmm. And then since then, since Beloved in those 30 years, um, regularly tuning in to her wisdom you know, was an important part of me and you know, for so many people as well. Absolutely, and I think the second part of the question is, um, is there one thing you can point to craft-wise that you feel that she's had the biggest impact on your work? Um, well, I think in terms of not shrinking from the truth, mm -hmm. people are beautiful, but also we're often quite ugly. Um, that's human history. Uh, that's the human character. And you can't really be truthful if you're avoiding that. Absolutely. So going to the dark place in yourself, going to the dark place in the people you meet, um, and, and, rec and reckoning with all the sort of darkness uh, we know from history. Absolutely. So to get into the Nickel Boys, um, I feel like this is your shortest book. It is. Yeah. I, I, I knew, <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, so can you talk about um, writing such a spare novel and, and how that's a departure from what you've done before? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I am getting smaller and smaller and more concise, and I think my next project, this could be like a tweet or something, I'm not really Absolutely. sure. Absolutely, right. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, definitely in the early part of my year, I, I did embrace that digressive, encyclopedic, ecstatic uh, American mode, um, drawing inspiration from, say, Moby Dick or Bradley's Rainbow, and uh, the voices are, are very, very big mm -hmm. and, and polyphonic. Um, I, I noticed with uh, the Underground Railroad, I would come to sections, like the museum section, which is two pages, and I was done, and would go on to the next scene. And I realized that if I'd written it 10 years before, it would have been like this postmodern, like jujitsu, like 
Who's the curator? <laughs> What's his theory? How do they build the tunnels? Um, and all, all that stuff was not interesting. I was more interested in Cora and not like the engineers. And so I felt, you know, uh, that staying focused on the characters and, and this less digressive mode uh, was working for me. If you've done something once, why do it again? And so, uh, and then with this book, I knew that it was going to be short. You know, there's only so much I, I wanted to write about the reform school before we got the point. Um, uh, I wanted to stick with the two characters. Mm -hmm. In the Underground Railroad, we get POV chapters from the slave master or the slave catcher. In the Nickel Boys, we don't really get the superintendent's point of view, the, the guards, the judges. Uh, it really is about the two boys. And so I knew going in, uh, it was going to be short, and I, I like the constraint. I, and I don't write short stories, but I was studying novellas and short novels, contemporary ones, like by Mohsin Hamid, Exit West, um, Julio Tsuka, The Buddha in the Attic. And I had successfully escaped in high school, in elementary school, uh, reading Ethan Frome. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> but then one day I was getting on a plane, I was like, I need some more novellas, and so I just Googled, like, Public domain, public domain novellas, mm -hmm. and of course, Edith Wharton, you know, dead as a doornail, no copyright, um, downloaded it, and, and that was good, that was great, it was a great book. Um, so, studying what to leave in, what, to, what, what you have to put in, what you can leave out, the kind of empty spaces in novellas uh, was just really great, and, um, and the challenge was, was, was good for me. Wonderful, and so, the Nickel Boys is divided between the 1960s and present day, so you can t talk about how you made that division happen, because so much of the book happens in the past. And I'm also thinking about just the weight of the history of the Dozier School and trying to divide um, the events and the trauma, the, the way the characters experience the trauma in present day. Yeah, I mean, um, I encountered the story in a present day, and, then, and so my first introduction to the stories were people in their 60s, 60s and 70s who uh, had a hard time finding their way after being at, at Dozier. Um, they've, they've experienced a traumatic, catastrophic event, and we know it, we have a language for PTSD now and trauma, what it does to people. And so I knew I wanted to have like two-thirds of the book set in the reform school, and then to follow Elwood uh, once he gets out and comes to New York in the 70s and 80s as he tries to reckon with this life-changing event. Can he find his way to normal, pe normal people? Um, a lot of the students who were there turned to drugs and alcohol. Some of them became habitual criminals. Um, some of them were never, never able to sort of connect with other people. And so it's one thing to leave, uh, but then what do you do afterwards? How do you reckon with this terrible thing? And so it was important for me to have that part of the story too. Um, can you find your way back to the life you've been shunted out of, mm -hmm. the world. And talk about your decision to give Elwood a friend. I mean, I love friend, you know, um, coming of age stories, you know. Um, talk about why it's so important that Elwood had someone else in his corner. Well, I mean, they're, you know, they're sort of two, you know, co-protagonists. We start with Elwood, he's a good kid. Um, he's grown up taking seeing advances made in civil rights in his lifetime, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. He grows up in Tallahassee. There are protests and boycotts that have worked and changed things materially uh, that he can see. Um, and he's sent to Nickel by hitchhiking with the wrong person and uh, on the way to take college classes. Um, and his optimism calls out for his opposite number. And so he came quickly. I knew that I wanted to have this innocent take the plate, stand in for all sort of young people of color who are just walking down the street and then they have an encounter with a policeman and it can go either way. It can be innocent or life altering. They can be asked for an, an ID and reach too quickly and they get shot, which happens. Uh, um, they can be just taken to jail and that one night in jail can turn into all sorts of uh, different, uh, different branching off of, of your experience. And so, um, he's so, he's an innocent, and it does call for someone who's 
a little more grounded. And so, and so Turner is the other boy. He's an orphan. Uh, he's never had anybody in his life the last couple years. And he doesn't think people can change. He doesn't think systems change. Um, and all you can really do is survive. That's the highest sort of ideal you can set for yourself. And so Elwood came first, but then the vacuum of his goodness summons up uh, Turner. Wonderful. And so when I was reading it, I, I couldn't help but think about um, Jasmine Ward's Sing and Buried Sing um, and the comparisons between um, what was happening in the reform school and then what's happening in, in the prison in her novel. And I'm just wondering if you came across any bit of fascinating research um, linking those two ideas, right? The school and the, because the school and this and the prison are very closely related for black children in the South, right? It's, it's no, they're, the they're, 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 yeah, they're different, different size cages. Right. Um, and so uh, in the book, in the acknowledgments, I mentioned the movie Brubaker, which I saw again when I was really young, Robert Redford. And it's based on the, the memoirs of a, a warden in the Arkansas prison system. And so I went back to that book when I was doing research for this book and some of the corruption, you know, supplies for the inmates in the prison going to the community, um, the, uh, the construction materials to build a roof, going out the back door and so it collapses and killing people, all come from, uh, from that book. And uh, uh, how common it was in, in the South in, in prisons. And uh, he writes about finding the, the warden about finding, uh, finding graves on the prison sites that are unmarked, how they get there. A, prison out of, a prisoner gets out of line. Uh, they tell the world they escape, but actually they're in the ground. And that's the same thing that happened in Dozier. The same thing happens in, uh, if, you, if you know the story of the St. Mary's School for Unwed Mothers in Ireland two years ago, they found bodies of children and babies. Um, and, with, and when I've been traveling with the book, people have said, oh, this reminds me of the residential schools in Canada. Uh, they took indigenous children from their families to teach them white culture, and some of the same abuses happened. I was in Houston yesterday, and uh, I read the, the de details a few months ago, but people were like, there's a, a prison called Sugarland or Sugarville outside Houston, and they just found a bunch of dead bodies uh, from you know, dating back decades. Uh, this is how we treat, I, you know, I think most of it in terms of children, how people in power treat the completely defenseless, um, but it's also how we treat prisoners right. and our incarcerated millions. Right, right. Um, and then I'm wondering if you can talk about your decision um, to include Dr. King's words in the text, and do you feel like the book would be the same without those excerpts of Dr. King's speeches? Well, I mean, uh, I was talking to some students today about how I outline things, and you make a decision for a character, then you have to follow through. So with Core in the Underground Railroad, um, is the, will my protagonist be a male or a female? If it's a female protagonist, um, there's a different set of problems. You're subject to your, mas subject to your master's sexual desires. You're supposed to pump out babies, because more babies means more slaves, more money for your master. Um, so if you commit to a female protagonist, you have to deal with, does she have kids? How old is she? She's probably uh, been sexually abused, and that determines her psychology. In the case of, of, um, uh, of this book, I decided to have said the book in 63. It's the height of Jim Crow, but it's also the moment where we're seeing advancement in terms of civil rights. So we have that optimism and pessimism. We have progress and, uh, and, and, and no progress. Um, so who who he be inspired by, and that's Dr. King. He works in a stationery store. He is reading Life magazine every week, and he sees these dynamic crusaders. Um, and then, you know, it grows. Like, if he's attracted to Dr. King, which speech, um, uh, which speaks, which speech speaks to Elwood's personality, and which speech. Uh, addresses the larger thematic concerns, how much, uh, uh, where does it go? Um, so um, he became an important voice. You know, in some ways, Elwood is like this really super goody-goody that I can't relate to. 
uh, but he was part of this real generation. And hearing Dr. King's voice after decades, you know, I hadn't really studied him in a while, I realized that, oh, it is not really unlikely. He's part of like people who actually, you know, did things. Right. And uh, he is impossible, and so is Dr. King. How do you leave your house to march knowing that at the end of the street, uh, there are white men with fire hoses and, and guns and pickaxes waiting to beat you up, but they did it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, he, you know, going back to King and uh, the story of his uh, uh, various protests and marches kept me grounded in the, re the real reality of that generation. So I'm gonna ask one non-craft, so I'm not a fan of non-craft questions, but I'm gonna ask one not craft question is just how do you protect yourself when you're writing something like this? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's two heavy books in a row. Yes. <laughs> um, I usually <laughs> have books with more jokes, and in this case, uh, I felt compelled to you know write the Nickel Boys. Um, with Underground Railroad, I did the heavy lifting before I started. Um, it's one thing to watch Roots when, I'm, when I was eight, another thing to, as a 40-something to really delve into the history in a more serious way. And I had to reckon emotionally with the fact that it's a miracle I'm here, that this or that ancestor wasn't killed in the Middle Passage, wasn't killed in this plantation, and they some, somehow had a kid who had a kid who had a kid, um, that sort of existential dilemma. Um, since I was deforming American history in the story of slavery with the fantastic part of underground, I wanted to get it right in Georgia before I got it wrong. So I, wanted, I was gonna have a realistic depiction of the plantation, which means it's brutal. It's not like Gone with the Wind, where some white lady is being self-actualized against the backdrop of slavery. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're burning my house down. They should burn your fucking house down. You're a fucking slaving, a slaver asshole. Um, so it was going to be brutal. Um, with the Nickel Boys, uh, I knew it was tough. And for the first time, like, for the last six weeks, I was just really bummed out and depressed. Like, um, I intended to go down and actually see Dozier. I kept putting it off and putting it off. And then I started, you know, started to have a heaviness in my chest when I thought about going down there. And I realized I was so invested in Elwood and Turner and also the, the, the real life stories I'd read as inspiration that I hated the place and it would only go with like a bulldozer and dynamite. Um, so I never went. And now it's, not, it's barely there because Hurricane Michael a year and a half ago destroyed the place. And if you see it now, it's, like a, it's totally ruined or a lot of the buildings are ruined and it's sort of inner nature is now written on its outer nature. It's like a really um, dilapidated and, and ruined place. Uh, but self-care, I was depressed for six weeks. I finished the book and then played video games for another six weeks. <laughs> NBA 2K? Uh, XCOM. Okay. <laughs> so plucky gang of survivors trying to kill the aliens. <laughs> Have any of the survivors reached out to you at all or the families of the survivors since the book's been published? Yeah, I mean, it, when the book was announced, I started getting emails and... Um, it was really strange the first person who reached, reached out to me was African American, same age as, as Elwood. And in the book, Elwood moves to Broadway on 83rd Street in Manhattan. And he, the guy who reached out to me, moved to 84th and, and Broadway in the late wow. 60s. That was weird. Wow. And so we had lunch. Uh, we had lunch and uh, um, uh, he was the first person I met from there. And he said it was great. He learned discipline uh, there. He learned uh, trades. Uh, there was no homosexuality. He stressed that a lot. Um, uh, and um, uh, he, he sort of mimed the beatings. And it was still obvious that the beatings were still vivid with him. He'd been to the White House, the, the place where it occurred. Um, and so. It wasn't a murder factory, and that's his experience, and, or how he has processed his experience. Right, right. Um, everyone else I've met um, uh, has, you know, has shared the stories of what happened to them, and it's usually terrible. 
Um, I'm, I've been glad that they've liked the book, mm -hmm. unless they're just humoring me. Um, and if it approaches even like, you know, a fragment of, of what they actually went through, I'm, I'm really glad. And I'll meet also family members who are like, my brother was there, he never talked about it afterwards, he was never the same. My uncle was there and we never talked about it. Um, he just came back and he was never the same when he came back. So, so as we're talking, you know, you're, you are um, relating the Nickel Boys to the Underground Railroad a lot. And I'm wondering if you feel like the Nickel Boys has relation to your other novels in any way. Well, I think um, there are things that occur, you know, pop culture, the city, um, then race in America, uh, humor. Usually there's more jokes than those last two. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely the last two, you know, their slavery was a system of control. Jim Crow was a system of control. Um, uh, a lot of the processes that uh, are operating on Cora are transformed after slavery ends into Jim Crow laws and segregation in, in its various guises, but they end up doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're operating on Elwood and Turner and the rest of the boys. Um, and Dr. King, and, and of course, obviously today, you know, I, I mentioned people getting picked up now by police, but uh, Dr. King is marching to protect voting rights in the 60s, you know, uh, literacy test where you, you want to vote, and you ask the white person who's president, and they say JFK, and the black person comes up, and they say, recite the Declaration of Independence, and, and now, that was made outlawed, and so now we just closed down voting precincts in minority neighborhoods, um, voter ID, uh, fewer voting machines in minority neighborhoods. And so the system changes uh, um, its form, but the systems persist. Um, and as someone who's read and enjoyed all of your novels, and most of them taking place in New York, can you just talk about um, just tackling Florida and the mytho, you know, the Florida man. Um, there's yes, <laughs> so yeah. many jokes around Florida, right? Um. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, the, the research helps, and uh, everything, everything is online these days with the underground, all of the um, interviews that the, um, the WPA did with surviving slaves in the 1930s are online. We own them, they're public property. You can get them pretty easily. A lot of slave narratives also in public domain. Um, you know, the more research I can do for my home, the happier I am. You know, when you leave the house, there's so many... Um, <laughs> people? That's the word, people. <laughs> and, and if I can avoid human interaction, I usually call it a win for young Colson. Um, but, uh, uh, and so, and so I'm a very visual writer, so I'm, I'm trying to get on the page, and, and photographs and archives allow me to visualize it and get onto the page. And so um, uh, um, I'm reckoning with the Florida of these people, and they told me their stories, and I'm you know, sort of processing them. And I want to stay on the Nook Boys, but you know, we have a few more minutes, so I just want to squeeze in a question about if you can let us know anything about the adaptation of the Underground Railroad. Um, I know you've signed many NDAs, but is there anything you can tell us at all about the project? No, yeah, it's been adapted by Barry Jenkins, who did Moonlight. It's going to be a 10-episode miniseries, and they're filming it now in, in Georgia. Oh, okay. And um, that's pretty exciting. Hopefully, I can go down there. Um, I'm not involved with it. You know, okay. if I was involved with it, I wouldn't have written The Nickel Boys. Mm. So... Uh, that's a great answer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I had nothing to do, I'd be like, right, sure. Right. I mean, but I had stuff to do, so I didn't. Um, I didn't, you know, and talking to Barry, uh, I met him twice. I'm like, Barry, Barry Jenkins, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but it's one thing to have, say, in Underground Railroad, a uh, core in an attic for 60 pages. Right. How do you make that dynamic for the screen, you know? Uh, so he came up with some, lo some solutions. Uh, for the adaptation that were really smart. I had one contribution. Uh, uh, there's an a, a actor named Walton Goggins, you know him? He usually plays like the hick. I think he's, he's totally talented. And I thought, you know, sort of a la Eddie Murphy in Dr. Doolittle or The Clumps, 
he could play every white character, like <laughs> white lady, little white kid, oh uh, just like <laughs> Walton Goggins, CGI. Um, so I tweeted back, tweeted that to Barry, and never heard anything. So I'm not sure if he <laughs> was just offline that day, or <laughs> right, right. It's a surprise for me. They're going to say we got Walt, Walt, you know, Walton Goggins for you. Right, right. Um, and we're also going to be waiting on your Stanley cameo, Stanley like cameo sure. in the movie. Um, we'll see. Yeah. I think we're almost at time. Can three minutes. Well, uh, maybe talk about uh, what I'm working on now. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to switch genres. Um, so we're in a zombie novel, a coming of age novel, these two historical novels. So I'm wrestling with two ideas now, and I'm trying to decide which one uh, to do. One sort of less obvious for me, it's a romance. Ooh. It's a, a love story set on the eve of the Russian Revolution. Ooh. Um, Say there more. There are a lot of white people in it, so for research I'm watching reruns of the Golden Girls. Uh, <laughs> taking, Des no taking notes. Designing Women is on Hulu now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the other one is more obvious. It's science fiction, which I've sort of done before in Zone 1, uh, but specifically science fiction set in the Star Wars universe. Um, you know, they're making all these sequels now, expanding the canon, and you know, I think there's room for my vision. Um, I don't see why not. Uh, I know Disney's really protective <laughs> of their intellectual property, but if you ask me, copyright is a really outmoded concept, like falling in love or being happy or something. And, and I think I can make a, you know, a con you know, um, there's a lot of unanswered questions in Star Wars. I uh, want to tell you a secret, and I hope we can stay friends after. Yeah. I've never seen Star okay, Wars. Okay, well, oh, you're missing out. Uh, any of the movies. I just feel like I arrived to them really late, and then there were so many, and then prequels and sequels. <laughs> yes. and, and I was like, where do I start? Like, it's too much. It's yes. too much. We start the original Star Wars. OK, OK. Yeah. I'm going to start with your book. OK, well, yes. There it's, we go. No. <laughs> I mean, uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions in Star Wars, like in the first movie, for example. Some of you know. Uh, Shade. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, the Death Star, which is a, a weapon the size of a moon, small moon. They have lightsabers, which are literally swords made out of laser. I know about those. And they have hyperspace drive that can take you from one end of the universe to the other in the blink of an eye. But R2-D2 can't get a fucking voice box. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, you know, he's just like, <laughs> um, he's the smartest movie in all the movies, smartest character in all the movies. You know what, um, Google Translate, we should, you should think about Google Translate for RT, RT, R2D2. 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 R2. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I honestly have never seen it, no interest. <laughs> I think we're going to open it up for audience questions and I want to, well first of all, a round of applause for Colson White. Thank you. And we're looking for excellent questions um, that are questions. I will cut you off because that's my job. That's what they paid me to do. Um, in making the book, um, did you interview any survivors? Or like, how did you do the research to get the detail in your book? Sure. Um, uh, newspaper accounts. There are uh, some mem memoirs. The survivors have like a website where um, dozens and dozens of people have given their those are stories, and some are like two paragraphs, some are like 300 words, um, and, uh, and then photo archives. I, I didn't want to talk to anybody because I wanted to have my own voice, so it is a school, and it is how it worked, and then I invent, I populate it with my own folks. Thank you. Well, that's going to pass. Hi there. Could you talk a little bit about the beginnings of your writing career and how long it took you to become a great writer? <laughs> Um, yeah, I was talking to some students today. I wanted to write from a very early age. You know, I was like, uh, I didn't like leaving the house. I still don't. And um, so my perfect day was like reading Marvel comics, late 70s Marvel. It was a great time to love Spider-Man and X-Men. Uh, my mom's like Stephen King books, uh, science fiction, watching The Twilight Zone. And until I got to college, I wanted to write 
like the black Salem's Lot or the black Shining. Like any Stephen King title with the black in front of it is what I want to do. <laughs> um, I got a job. I was, I was rejected from all the writing classes at, at, at college. I would apply and be turned down. And that was really depressing. But looking back, it was good training for being a writer. Because when you're a writer, everyone hates you. And if you internalize that hatred early, you'll be prepared right. <laughs> later on. And I started working at the Village Voice when I got out. And the Village Voice was a great place to be a young writer. You could just nag people for work. And after um, six months, I approached the TV editor and got my big break into journalism, writing a think piece about the series finales of the show's Growing Pains and Who's the Boss. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, looking back, you know, I think it really holds up as a definitive work on those right. two seminal Tony sitcoms. Danza. Tony Danza. Tony Danza. <laughs> um, and then that gave me confidence to write fiction. And I wrote a novel. Everyone hated it. And so I think I became a writer when everyone rejected my first novel and my agent dumped me. And I realized that I guess I have to start again. I wasn't going to get a real job. Um, if I could do something else, I would. Uh, but I had to pick myself up and start the next book. And maybe that one won't get published, but I'll be a better writer for having written two books. Mm -hmm. And then I'll write the third one, and I'll be a little better. And um, uh, that turned out to be The Intuitionist. But that was like my big, it wasn't wanting to be a, write, a writer. It wasn't writing for a living as a, as a journalist. It was, there's nothing else I can do to make myself whole or complete, but to keep writing. So. There's someone on this side here. I have a question. So since you've written. Uh, can you raise your hand? Yeah. Oh. OK, hi. Hi. Um, since you've written to these last two novels about the major plights of African Americans starting like Underground Railroad to Nickel Boys. If you were gonna write a novel about the plight of African Americans now, what would you focus on? Uh, the plight of African Americans now? It's slavery <laughs> and, uh, and Jim Crow. Right. Um, yeah, there's nothing else to add on top of, top of that, except a white supremacist president who wants to bring us back to, you know, the most severe things of Jim Crow. Um, but it all starts, you know, slavery is not the original sin of America. It's the dispos dispossession of Native Americans. Sorry, slavery, yeah, of African Amer Africans isn't the original sin. It's the dispossession of Native Americans. And slavery comes swiftly after. Um, but those, you know, what happened 400 years ago ripples out in different ways. So thank you for your question. Hi, I'm curious to know um, what you are currently reading, watching, and listening to. Reading, watching, listening to. I always go blank when, when that's asked. Um, uh, I started Robert Caro as the power broker 18 years ago. And uh, I only got uh, 20 pages in. So I started again this, this spring, and I got 700 pages in. So I had 300 to go. Um, also, when people die, I start reading their backlist. So uh, I started Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed last week. And we'll see how, how far I get. You know, traveling, throw me off. Listening to, I haven't really had any big musical breakthroughs um, uh, recently, unfortunately. Um, uh, I got this new Angel Olsen Lark single, but I'm not sure if I like it, but I keep playing it, so there's something there. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, and then watching, I guess I've been, I've been bullied into watching Secession. Everyone's like, Me Secession. Too. I guess I'll just l watch it then. Um, but in terms of what I have seen this year, Fleabag is great, Chernobyl is great, um, uh, uh, Catastrophe is great. So. Who's your favorite sibling on Succession? I've only seen the first one, I've seen the, the pilot. Your answer is supposed to be Shiv. I, I, I don't even know their names yet. Okay. Um, okay. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tonight I'm going to episode two. Okay. First of all, thank you for coming. It's great hearing from you. Um, I have a question regarding the genre of your last two novels. Um, they've been historical fiction, and I'd like uh, to hear your um, take on what perhaps historical fiction as a genre can teach us or what it can offer that other genres of fiction can't. 
Yeah, I, I don't think about it that way. I just think of it as fiction. Um, obviously, we have bookstores, and there's a science fiction section and a horror section, and a, you know. So, but um, I don't see them as historical novels. I just see them as novels. And does a historical novel with a fantastic structure like Underground Railroad qualify as a historical novel, or is it fantasy? Um, I was glad that it was awarded uh, the Arthur C. Clarke Award for science fiction in the UK. So if, it's, if science fiction is a historical novel, so I don't think about labels. To me, it's just writing. And genres, it's like, there's two, there's two genres, and there's shit you like and shit you don't like. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Um, what can historical novels do that other, other things, other novels can't? Um, I'm not sure. So, but thank you for, thanks for the question. Hi, um, I actually saw you speak in Aspen at the Words Festival with my mom, and we really appreciated your... In the spring? Yeah, your sense of humor and your honesty, and she just saw your CBS News interview, and I was wondering if you've noticed any effects uh, coming from your book, if there's been any more like coverage on the actual school, any like more... Sorry, has the, has the book led to any more coverage on the school? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, a little bit. I mean, I think... Um, it was, uh, well, it depends, because it was well known in northern Florida. It was, it was covered extensively before they found the bodies. You know, it was the journalism of people like Ben Montgomery, the Tampa Bay Times, that led to the closing of the school. Um, it's only popped some th up into national media, uh, very rarely, but I've done some national shows, and so people are hearing about it for the first time. Um, in the spring, they found more suspicious radar pings that might be more bodies. So that brought it you know, a, a day or two in the national media in the spring. Um, they are gonna start ex excavating the site. So more people know about it, and partially that's because they found more bodies, partially it's because of the book. Um, but it uh, doesn't change anything. The school is closed. The state of Florida apologized. Mm. And, and the people who did, who did the crimes uh, live long, happy lives and never punished. And the people who they victimized uh, are, you know, some, some are fine, like the first guy I talked to, you know, says he's fine. But a lot of people are ruined by their experience there. So, um, and we still have, if we're talking about how we treat children. We have incarceration camps in Texas where refugee children are being supervised in for-profit centers by guards who have no training dealing with young children. And the stories of, of what happened at Dozier are being echoed in some of the reports that are coming out there, if, if not worse, because uh, an example is being made of these people who are, are coming over the border. So. Um, I was very moved at how both boys experienced mother loss. What's your sense for um, what kind of imprint that left? You know, Elwood's mother just abandoned. Him. Sorry, the, the last part? Well, Elwood's mother abandoned him. She yeah. was depressed and left. And what's your sense for how that changed them? Well, I mean, um, like I said, it's, it's not just uh, juvenile offenders. It's also people who have no family, orphans who went to Dozier. So I want to represent their side. Um, uh, the boys are, are so alone that, you know, I made the choice to have Elwood also, you know, be a abandoned uh, by, his, by his parents. Um, and they really only have each other. You know, I, I read the Griff part. Griff is a jerk. Uh, but he gets some bad treatment, and he doesn't deserve it, even though he's a jerk. And so all of the boys, you know, there's that, that there is that motherlessness um, of all that all the unprotected, unprotected have, you know, in a certain sort of way. So that's why. Now, thanks for your question. Uh, first off, congratulations on uh, your career and uh, following up Underground Railroad, which was just a tremendous book with the Nickel Boy. Your concept or your comment that you're a very visual writer. Many times reading that book, where I would just just shudder physically or talk to myself and just just 
was just amazed by the economy of language. We need your question, honey. Your question is, yes. what was your state of mind after finishing Noble House to write these two very heavy books coming off a book playing poker tournament? Oh, The Noble Hustle. Yeah, I mean, um, for oh, me, the uh, the po uh, my, my book before Underground Railroad was a nonfiction account of a depressed writer in Brooklyn who goes to the World Series of Poker. So it was a memoir about my life. And um, <laughs> uh, for me, it's a book of humor. I just crammed as many jokes as I could into it. Silly jokes, you know, jokes that pay off over 100 pages. And um, it is so full of jokes. It allowed me to do two books that are completely joyless in terms of... Uh, um, so, so that, but I think uh, there's, you know, the thematic link between Underground and Nickel Boys. Usually I go from, you know, I went from tender coming of age story, Sag Harbor, to a nonfiction book about, fiction book about poker, uh, no, to a zombie book, to a nonfiction book about poker, so I skip around more. And like I said, I think earlier, if you know how to do something, why do it again? Uh, so it seems natural that I would write a book about poker and then write about American slavery. And the book, I really am working, I'm not writing a book about the Russian Revolution or Star Wars. I'm working on a crime novel set in Harlem in the 60s. And it doesn't deal with race in the same way. It deals with race because uh, there are black characters in the 1960s. Um, it deals more about the city, which means real estate, which means capitalism. So, uh, but it's very different from the last two things I did. And I think, um, when I was a kid, I listened to a lot of David Bowie and watched a lot of Stanley Kubrick. And Stanley Kubrick would do his war picture and his sci-fi movie and his horror movie. And David Bowie would have like one persona for this, Ziggy Stardust for this record, and then the Thin White Duke, and he'd always have these different characters he'd do. And I think I just internalized that that's how you do art. If you do something once, why do it again? Um, like, like all of you, I like different kinds of stories. And if I keep writing, I can do my zombie story, because I grew up loving horror movies, and I can write my historical fiction about slavery, because I encountered Toni Morrison in college. And so um, it doesn't make sense from the outside, but it makes sense to me. You know. And then I believe you're our final question for the evening, so make it fantastic. OK, I'll try. <laughs> um, what's your writing process, as in how, where, when, and with what do you write? Sure, yeah. I mean. Um, you should always do what works for you. Uh, some people say write every day. That seems like real imposition is on my real? lifestyle. Is that real? Uh, I don't. It wouldn't work for me. Um, <laughs> but Graham Greene would like write through into words and then stop, and he wrote like 50 books. So you know, uh, so do what works for you. But for me, four or five days a week, like from 10:30 to three, that's a good day's work. Whew. One to three pages. And if I can do eight pages a week, I'm making progress. So eight pages, it could be Monday and Wednesday and Friday, or Thursday through Sunday. But if I get eight, eight pages, you know, after four weeks, that's like 30-something. After nine months, that's like 300, or it's, you know, and that's like a novel. <laughs> if I write four a year, four, four a week, that's 300 in two years, and that's a novel. So. Writing a novel is so terrible that if I can break it down and see it get a, a closer, I feel good. Like whether it's, if I can see the ending, I feel better. Whether it's a novel or a children's birthday party, if I know <laughs> there's a definite end. And, um, I'm always, and also, if I, if I get up and don't feel like working that day or have a dental appointment, I don't work, uh, I can revise maybe. So I'm always going forward and back and forward and back and revising as I go along. So when I get to that last page, it's pretty done. Like the next week I'll proofread it and change some things around, but that first draft is pretty done because I have gone over everything except that last three pages like many, many times. So. Can we get another round of applause for Pulsing Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.